see that doggy in the shelter? The one with the take me home eyes. If you give him love and attention. Welcome to a new community television program, You and Your Pets, and with our resident expert, Dr. Ernest Rogers, the head of the Maplewood Animal Hospital. And this show is going to be talking about a great number of pet topics, everything from the what kind of pet you might have to the health of your pet to what veterinarians do and some of the more interesting things that they get involved in. So let's get started with a real basic. Who should be a pet owner? Well, I think we have to look at the lifestyle of the person. Not every lifestyle is amenable to having a pet, but most people can fit pets into their lives and be very successful, depending on the pet, depending on the place they live, and depending on what their lifestyle includes. Many people who have pets have time for their pets, they can exercise their pets. Often they have to take them out for different runs, different exercising, depending on the pets. People who travel significantly sometimes have a hard time raising a pet and keeping them in line because, again, many times the pet is either in a kennel or with a stranger. Uh, but most people can find a place in their heart and a place in their life to have a pet and to enjoy them. Cats are a little bit easier to take care of than dogs and certainly things like goldfish and uh, uh, hamsters and guinea pigs can be still easier to take care of. But most people can find a place in their heart. People certainly who have had uh, numerous challenges in their life, whether it be physical or mental, sometimes benefit from having a pet, but they may not be able to completely care for a pet on their own without someone helping them. So is there an age at which is, it, it's good to have a pet. I know when our daughter turned five, we promised her she could have a dog at the age of five. I'm not sure if that wasn't a little too early for her or not, but uh, we ended up caring for it anyhow. Right. But uh, what, what, what age for a child? Well, I think no child, no matter what the age or the level of uh, maturity, will really be able to fully take care of an animal. It's always the parent's responsibilities. Uh, taking care of any animal really requires attention to detail and that's a level that most children don't have. I've grown up with a pet, I've had a pet since I was knee-high to a grasshopper and still in diapers and I think many of the, much of the research has shown that children that grow up with pets do very well as an adult because of their interaction with pets. Mm -hmm. But in general most children cannot take care of pets. Young adults who are in university and doing quite a bit of traveling and free-spirited also sometimes can have challenges in taking care of their pets, either because of the monetary issues or because of the stability issues, moving from apartment to apartment where sometimes they aren't allowed. But I think the age is really dependent on the stability of the person, stability of the family. So young children should definitely be exposed to pets, but not be expected to take care of them. And stable families, Families that have a place in their heart again for pets will make great owners and will be able to have the benefits of and the joy of having a pet. Well, I uh, I recall when I was when I was young, I was in 4-H, and we were given animals to that we had to feed every day, water every day. I raised sheep. Well, one of my other brothers raised cows and that sort of thing. But the object there was to teach us responsibility. Is that something you should be attempting to do with a pet? I think that's very important and that it should be done, but not expected. We can, always ex we can always help our children learn responsibility through dealing with a pet from insur for ensuring that the pet is properly housed, properly exercised, properly taken care of, but it's very unlikely that a child is going to be able to take care of all the needs of a pet. My main concern, I think, with younger children is not that they can't do partial taking care of the pet and be mature enough to take care of the pet in some situations, but only that it's not likely they're going to be able to take 100% care of the pet. You mentioned 4-H. 4-H is a very unique club, and it's uh, usually among people who have come from farm country, but it's also in the urban environment, and that is a club where they are given the instruction on how to properly take care of both farm animals and domestic animals, domestic pets. So. That's a slightly different situation, but I think, yes, any child could learn to take care of a pet to a certain extent. Okay. 
So let's move on to another topic, dog or cat. How do I know if I'm, if I have never had a pet in my life and I really kind of want to have one, how do I know what I should do? It should be dog or cat or both. Uh, I, I have a feeling that there are quite a few of our viewers have both dogs and cats in the house. Is that something one should even attempt if one's coming getting a pet for the first time or should one just choose one or the other and get used to it? Well, I, I think I would say that you can't limit yourself simply to dog and cat. There are guinea pigs, hamsters, um, geckos, uh, tarantulas, and we have many more uh, animals that people would consider filling the need of a pet than simply dogs and cats. But I agree with you. The two primary in the United States and in Canada is the dog and the cat. Now, for people who travel a lot, a dog can be a challenge. Um, for people who try to like to take weekend trips, a cat would be probably more satisfactory. But not everyone likes cats and not everyone likes dogs. In fact, if you go back to the 1940s Rockwell painting of the waiting room for the veterinarian, you'll see there's not a single cat in that painting. <laughs> so back in the 20s, 30s and 40s, cats weren't considered pets. I think it's a personal preference. You have to look, you have to enjoy, enjoy your relatives, your friends, people who have pets that you know you think you might want to uh, spend time with and get the feeling for how much care is needed, how the pets react when you're at their house, whether or not you're allergic. Uh, something as simple as an allergy in the family can prevent the obtaining of a certain pet, whether it be a dog or a cat. That's in our family, cats. We can't have them around because we're allergic. Uh, not so with dogs. Right. And, and similarly with, uh, with dogs and cats, there are numerous lifestyle issues that can come up. Allergy is one. Another one is space. If you live in an apartment, you may not be able to have anything except a fish or a gerbil <laughs> or maybe just a cat. Mm -hmm. um, certainly knowing that cats have to be uh, well taken care of, their litter has to be changed, there are certain health issues associated with any animal if it's not well taken care of, and so it's really a personal preference. You really have to identify someone who has the animals that you're interested in, go to pet shows, go to cat shows, go to dog shows, and get the feel of what a dog or cat, what the variations are. Some dogs require more exercise than others. Some dogs are lazy, just plain lazy, will sit around and all they want to do is watch television with you, <laughs> while other dogs will jump on your face and bounce off your lap if you don't give them an hour of exercise every day. So I think you really have to fit it in with your lifestyle, but you also have to have a passion for that pet because it's, it is a lot of work. It's like a second child or a first child. It can be a lot of work. Yes, that, that was something that I think we learned once the dog came in the house, which is that we, had, we did have a second child in the house, except this child remained needy all the time. Uh, uh, of course, it doesn't go to college, so that saves you that's true. sixty or seventy thousand dollars, and it's a lot cheaper. doesn't have a driver's <laughs> license. But yeah, they they do give us a lot of love and affection. And and though some people have their preferences, I have both cats and dogs in my house, and they both give me love and affection in their own little way, and make me feel like as if I'm needed and wanted. Mm -hmm. And so I I don't have a preference, but individuals certainly do. Well, then let's turn to a, uh, uh, a more practical topic. Should one be looking at a shelter animal, a purebred, or does it make a difference? I mean, obviously there's a price difference in, 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 in that. Uh, is there a difference between a purebred and a, uh, and a mongrel, for example? Uh, are there more problems associated with inbred purebreds that you would not find with a, a typical uh, shelter dog? Well, typically, I think you, you, hit on, you hit the nail on the head. Whether it be a purebred cat or a purebred dog, the price is, is often much greater, much steeper than it would be if you were going to a kennel or to a uh, shelter and picking up an animal. Certainly, purebred dogs can be obtained. There are a lot of rescue organizations, German Shepherd Rescue Organization, Irish Setter Rescue Organization, that are looking for people to foster animals that have either of that breed that is, have either been given up or have been accepted by someone who can't no, can no longer keep them. But they often have animals that you can get at a reasonable cost. Now, in terms of purebred versus the mutt, if you can say that, I think mutts tend to be 
all over the place. They breed on their own sometimes and we find them in shelters much more than we find purebred animals. And in a lot of ways, they need a person more than a purebred animal. Mm -hmm. Someone who's looking, <clears throat> excuse me, someone who's looking for a purebred animal will find that animal and be able to adopt it. Not all mutts are the cutest thing. They don't all have reasonable backgrounds and pedigrees. So um, it really depends again on what you, what you prefer. If you want a specific dog of a specific size, for a specific reason, then probably the purebred is where you should go if you're willing to spend that money. <clears throat> okay. Uh, what shelters are available in the Maplewood South Orange area that you could recommend people to uh, visit? I think there are a number of shelters and a number of organizations. <coughs> I wouldn't limit it to the Maplewood South Orange area. I think most veterinarians have a number of pets that come through that can be adopted. There is uh, um, there is the, uh, let me see, there's the uh, Animal uh, Associated Humane Society, <clears throat> which unfortunately is a shelter that um, has a policy that if an animal stays too long, they will put it to sleep, and that's a very needy place. Um, Newark is trying to start a brand new shelter. In Maplewood, there's really only one shelter, and that's the Jersey Animal Coalition. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, will keep an animal as long as they can until they can find a home for it. So you can see that different shelters have different policies, and as such, um, animals at some shelters are much more needy than animals at other shelters. Should, I, uh, should one be considering a mature dog if you go get one, whether it's a purebred or a, uh, a shelter animal? or get one that's young that you can train. I mean, some people aren't good at training. I'm terrible at training an animal. I mean, I just, I just can't do it. They, they train me, I don't train them. Uh, but what, what should one, is, is that a matter of preference? Well, I think it's a matter of preference, but also you should go and see your veterinarian and discuss your choices with your veterinarian. Many times getting a shelter animal, the shelter animal has been given up for a reason. Not always aggression, but sometimes aggression. Not always inappropriate urination or inappropriate defecation in the house, but sometimes that. And sometimes it's a matter of the animal just outgrew what I expected. So I think you have to decide with your veterinarian and discussing with your veterinarian what would be the most appropriate animal for me and, and my house and my family. And that can be done at any time, certainly before the process starts. And then making the correct decision by going to the, once you've limited it to the type of animal or your preference of animal, and then trying to find that kind of animal. Certainly a shelter animal is, is more needy than, uh, than a purebred, but also the shelter animal may have a lot of great qualities being a mutt that you wouldn't find in purebred animals. Mm -hmm. There's also something called hybrid vigor. And that's something that you see in, in mutts that you might not see in purebred animals. Some purebred animals are known for their problems, medical problems, eye problems, um, that we don't see in mutts that have hybrid vigor. Uh, that's not to say that we don't have other problems in mutts, but certainly that's another consideration that your veterinarian can discuss with you. Okay, well, we've run out of time for this first well, half of the show, so we will be back in a short while. And when we do, we're going to introduce you to a wonderful little pet that will be in the second half of the show. We'll be right back. There's so many dogs with no... Television is a powerful and influential medium that allows different groups the opportunity to produce programming that directly affects their own communities. Public, educational, and government access channels ensure that all people, regardless of race, age, gender, disability, religion, or economic status, have access to local government information and the use of a public communication forum. Make sure everyone has a voice. Support your local pet channels. Hungry with no one to protect. We're back with Dr. Ernest Rogers of the Maplewood Animal Hospital, and we're discussing pets on you and your pets. And we would like to introduce you to a wonderful little pet, actually not so small, and this is Freckles. Freckles. And Freckles is a what? Freckles is a German short-haired pointer that was uh, wandering the streets when I found her. Unfortunately, she was almost hit by a car when I picked her up. And despite trying for almost a month, we couldn't find her owner. And so I adopted her, spayed her, and she decided she wanted to adopt me and my family, and so she lives with me now. 
And do you have any idea how old Freckles is? Freckles is about six years old. About six. So she's still a youngster yet. She's still a youngster. Okay. And tell me something about this breed. Uh, she seems to be very affectionate, like she, like she really wants to be around you. Most, this is actually a hunting breed, and uh, I have friends who breed them for hunting, whether it be uh, birds or, um, or rabbits. And, and this, this dog really has a great nose, likes to find things. But it's true. Again, your lifestyle de determines how your dog is going to respond to you. In this case, F uh, Freckles was brought up with me in the house and my family, and Freckles learned that she was part of the family, and she responds very well to the people that feed her, people that play with her and take mm -hmm. her outside. Um, she really hasn't been trained to hunt, but when she's outside, she'll chase birds and chase squirrels, <laughs> uh, like a lot of dogs will. But Freckles really can be trained as a hunter, it's just that I have chosen not to, and she seems to be perfectly fine with that. Now, Freckles is not your only animal at home, that's correct? <laughs> no, I've, I've actually in the past year lost two of my best friends. Uh, one was a black shepherd uh, named Bilko, and the other one was a black shepherd named um, Flex. And I lost both of them to cancer, unfortunately. I still have at home a cat called Tutoro, who's my uh, sleeping partner, I guess. He climbs on my chest and sleeps. I also have another dog named... Um, oh, geez, now I'm forgetting his name. Uh, another dog named uh, Tucker, who is, uh, he's been with me for over 10 years. And then at the hospital, we have two cats that like to run around at night, and one is Charlie, and the other one is Crystal. And they were both adopted because people were wanting to give them up. So you work long hours at the hospital. What is the pattern that, that you do to keep uh, freckles and your other animals well exercised? Could you go through that? Because I think some of the viewers who would, would also say go into Manhattan and work out long hours and come home would like to know uh, how, how to keep them uh, uh, occupied. Right. Well, it's, it's tough on my dogs. Uh, you know, they say the cobbler's children never get good shoes. Well, the veterinarian's dogs rarely get uh, ideal uh, conditions. <clears throat> in the morning when I get up, I let the dogs run outside for about an hour. I have a fenced-in yard that's about an acre. They run around outside and they get their exercise. They do what they have to do. And then they come in and they're fed. And as most dogs, they tend to sleep most of the day. Mm -hmm. I get home usually around 7, 8 o'clock at night. And at that time, I let them out again for two or three hours, weather, weather permitting. And then once they've had their exercise, they come in and they eat again. In general, when, I'm, when I can, I try and let them out three times a day, but that's difficult. Mm -hmm. They've learned to adapt, and they seem to be doing very well with what, uh, what exercise they get and where they are. Uh, again, it's they've adapted to my lifestyle, and I've tried to adapt to give them as much exercise as they can. Mm -hmm. In general, we prefer that animals go out three times a day, but as you know, that's not always possible. Right. Not everyone can do that. And so we can, we can adapt ourselves and have the animals adapt to be able to be outside twice a day and live very healthy, normal, functional lives. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd like to turn to a, a slightly different topic now that uh, now Freckles was, was an adoptee, but I'd like to look at it a little bit more specifically. A pet store animal. How does an owner, a potential owner know going into a pet store and seeing that wonderful little doggy in the window and saying, Gee, I'd really think I'd like to have that doggy, but I'm not sure about health. I'm not sure about anything else. I can't pick the doggy up and come to you as the veterinarian and say, "Would you please uh, examine this animal?" Like, say, a used car. Right. And right. and then, uh, so uh, what does what does an owner, a potential owner, look for? Well, the biggest thing about picking out an animal is initially not to be emotionally involved. I think you have to pick an animal based on what you want, certainly. But then from the pet store, you should go directly to your veterinarian become, before you become emotionally attached and cannot give up that animal. In New Jersey, there is a law, and I believe it's 14 days. If within the first 14 days, uh, you take your animal to a veterinarian, he examines it and finds that it's unfit for sale, and that's a specific term, mm -hmm. then you can return the animal and get your money back. Clearly, that doesn't happen if you have an animal that you're emotionally attached to and you don't want to give it up. So then the alternative to that law, as I understand it, is that if there is a problem with that animal, and sometimes 
on examination we find cardiac problems, eye problems. Sometimes the animals have an infection. Uh, parvovirus is one in dogs. Uh, certainly upper respiratory infection in cats. In that case then the person who sold it is responsible for payment or part, part payment of the uh, medical case, medical care for that animal. Mm -hmm. And there are limits that you should probably discuss with uh, a, a lawyer or uh, the pet store. But when you sign a document ta re releasing the animal from the pet store and taking it into your care, that document should be read and that gives you the specifics of the law in New Jersey. So yes, in a way it's sort of like a used car, but unlike a used car, you fall in love with it and you don't want to give it up and that's where the crux of the matter becomes difficult. So if Isn't you, that a little hard? I mean, not, not, not to push you on the yes. issue, but if I go to a store and I, I see <clears throat> that, that that doggy right there has just taken my heart, uh, I've already lost the game. Haven't, haven't I, I mean, I've really, haven't yes. I really lost the game yeah, already? You have, and that's why it's difficult to make those decisions. You pick a dog not because it's going to be good around the house. You pick a dog because it's likely to be a, a heart stopper. It's beautiful. He needs me. Mm -hmm. There's always an emotional attachment there. And once you've made that emotional attachment, to break that bond is very, very difficult. So, yes, and that's, I think, the way people sell animals. Um, a lot of breeders, uh, if you buy a purebred dog, will have you come and see the animal, look at it, play with it, and then come back at a later date if you still want it. Mm -hmm. A lot of emotional purchases made around Christmas, made around Easter, made around Thanksgiving, result in an animal being unwanted because it's a cute little kitten, but when it's an adult cat and needs uh, to be neutered and needs its vaccines and all of a sudden it's going to cost money, it's not so cute, it's released and it goes outside adding to the problems. Yeah. So yes, it, it is difficult, but getting your veterinarian involved both before you make the purchase and immediately after you make the purchase will give you some good counseling as to how to do that in the least traumatic way for your family. Okay, well let's then turn to breeders. Um, I go to, we, we, pick, we got our dog from, from a breeder. Max. Who, who, Max, our dog Max from a breeder, uh, who, who came to us very highly recommended. Uh, so we were lucky. Uh, we, uh, uh, you know, we didn't know this person or anything else. We the first time we met her is when we went to pick up the uh, the dog. I think we did everything wrong. Uh, I mean, because uh, we immediately fell for for Max, and and that was it. The, you know, he came home. Um, how how does one know? Uh, whether to deal with a particular breeder or not. I realize one should ask around, but uh, if you don't know anything at all, it's pretty hard to even ask around, isn't it? Again, your veterinarian is one of your best resources for anything to do with pets. Um, maybe we don't know everything about every breed, but certainly we can advise you on this matter. And, and as a veterinarian, my clients get advised to, number one, go to a number of dog shows. Westminster Dog Show occurs in New York. It's one of the biggest in the world. And you get an opportunity to see multiple breeds and speak to multiple breeders. Breeders know each other. They know who's the reputable, good quality dogs and mm -hmm. which ones are not. And in, in doing this interaction, this networking, so to speak, you'll speak to breeders. You can go to local, uh, local dog shows. There's one in Chester. New Jersey, there's several dog shows throughout New Jersey that you can go to and interact with the breeders. They will set you on the right track. Now beyond that, there's several magazines that have breeders in the back. Uh, dog Fancy is one. There are several others. And I think if you go to the back and look up the breeder's name, you will see information about that breeder. You can then go online and read about that breeder, but you're not going to get any better information than to talk to other breeders and find out who has puppies, what puppies are available, what puppies are good, who to stay away from, who to go with. And that's usually the best source of information once you've decided you want to get a purebred dog. Are there any obvious signs of an unhealthy animal that one, uh, that an, a lay person should be able to pick up uh, the first time they see the animal? Are there, are there things that, that are just so obvious that, uh, that one, one should take care immediately? Certainly, I think, and this is what draws people to animals. The dog is looking really depressed. 
the dog is not reacting as a normal puppy would, being curious or running or playing. Oh, he needs me. These kind of uh, signs of lethargy, signs of impending sickness, uh, where the animal is not doing very well, tends to draw the person who wants to be helpful. And those are signs, obviously, discharge from the eyes, discharge from the nose, um, diarrhea, um, vomiting, um, any animal that seems not to have a good healthy coat and a good healthy outlook, bright eyes. Um, those are all signs and I think we all know those signs. We just misinterpret them as the dog needs me so I'll get that dog. Mm -hmm. And often it's, it's probably not the right thing to do. So when you met up with Freckles to bring this to home, did, was Freckles a fairly healthy animal when you uh, found her wandering the streets? Freckles was almost hit by a car, got out of the way just in time, and yes, she was a healthy animal. For my assessment of animals, I do that every day, mm -hmm. and so it wasn't a difficult assessment for me to do. Um, Freckles has had her challenges, and we have had to treat her for parasites, as most dogs are do, and we have had to treat her for heartworm, and we've had to make sure that she was healthy, and we spayed her. So yes, Freckles was a healthy dog. But that doesn't eliminate the need for veterinary attention, even in a healthy dog. Mm -hmm. You should expect to pay somewhere between probably $300 and $1,000, depending on the animal and the veterinarian, for your first year's upkeep, including spaying, neutering, depending on whether it's a male or a female, vaccines, uh, and medications. Okay. So yes, even a healthy dog has issues that have to be addressed by the veterinarian. We're almost out of time. Is there any last words of advice that you'd like to give in this final minute? I think if there's anything I can say, pets are well worth their weight in gold. I find that for me, I couldn't do my job. I would never do anything other than being a veterinarian. And I don't think I would ever have loved my life in any way without a pet. And I hope everyone gets the opportunity to enjoy pets in their life as best they can, whatever pet that might be. Well, thank you very, very much. We've been talking with Dr. Ernest Rogers of the Maplewood Animal Hospital about you and your pets, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much for watching. To show them kindness and let them know they've been found. Do you see that doggy in the shelter? The one with the take me home eyes. If you give him love and attention, he will be your best friend for life.